So, good evening. Buenas noches. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, ARP Illinois is thrilled to uh, see you here this evening. My name is Bob Gallo. I am the state director for ARP Illinois. I live here in Chicago, vote here in Chicago, and love Chicago. And um, working with you to make it an even better Chicago for everyone who lives here. And so, but first we want to thank our um, community partners. Um, please uh, thank the Little Village Chamber of Commerce who's here this evening. Uh, Pilsen Neighbors Community Council. And Lasse and the 18th Street Development Corporation. Um, I'd also like to welcome Alderman elect Mike Rodriguez, who's here this evening. Mike, sitting right over there. Thanks for coming out with your daughter. And I like her shirt. <laughs> and she's hiding now. I, I know where you are. So the fact that you're here tonight shows that um, we've been hearing for quite some time that people age 50 plus and their families in all communities in Chicago uh, want their voices heard on issues that will make a difference in their lives. And just one thing to remind you of about that, so ARP is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. We do not endorse candidates. We do not make campaign contributions to candidates. But we do bring the voices of people age 50 plus, AARP members and their families here in Chicago, who want their voices heard on the most important issues in their lives in their communities and in their families. Um, and we will be taking all of all and any of your questions tonight um, and issues that you're concerned about and we'll be taking those directly to each of the candidates, Tony Preckwinkle and Lori Lightfoot, during what we call a Teletown Hall event. And we're going to be doing, doing two of those where we will be calling thousands of AARP members in the city of Chicago and having them the opportunity to get on the phone during those two events, one with Tony Preckwinkle, one with Lori Lightfoot, to share their concerns, ask their questions, and can get direct answers other than the 30-second television commercials that we're all being bombarded with, which really don't tell us very much, right? Uh, because that's what we want. We want these candidates both of which would like to be the next mayor, uh, to basically hear your voices. So stay tuned for information on how all of you can log on and participate. But in the meantime, we have a great panel of journalists and experts who will be discussing issues from the mayoral race. And we also want to hear from you, and I emphasize that you, because you're the most important people in the room here this evening. Um, many of you filled out, hopefully, some question cards. Um, I don't have one, but you've been, each been given one. So um, if you uh, have a question now, fill it out. If something comes up during the conversation that you're about to hear in a little while, um, you know, just wave it in the air and someone will come and get it from you. So please do that. And obviously, these are issues and concerns. Try to keep them pointed to the topic for tonight, which is, uh, you know, what do you want the next mayor uh, to be thinking about and planning for when she becomes the next mayor. And we'll be uh, you know, tackling those questions um, through the evening. Um, so um, with my, um, with my editor-in-chief, um, I'm sorry, with the, with the CEO, uh, Nakia, who's here with the Chicago Sun-Times, we're going to do an introduction of our panelists. And, um, we first have Chicago reporter and publisher and editor-in-chief, Fernando Diaz, um, here with us. And also, um, Chris Fusco, who's going to be the moderator for the evening. You want to uh, take the next one? Sure. I just wanted to say just a couple of words. So good evening. Uh, thank you so much for coming. This is the second um, opportunity that we have had to go out into the community. And we at the Sun-Times are committed to continue to do things like this to make sure that your voices are heard. So thank you so much for coming out. And we continue to encourage you to, to write questions. Um, in terms of panelists, we have here Carlos Ballesteros, who is a Chicago Sun-Times reporter. Um, also, 
the Illinois, ARP Illinois State President, Rosanna Marcus. Rosanna, thank you. Um, the editor and publisher of the Chicago Reporter, Fernando, to give you your opportunity to, to wave. And um, also Sun-Times columnist, Mark Brown. So I believe that's everyone, and we'll turn it over to Chris Fusco. Thank you. All right, good evening, everybody. Um, just a quick little overview here. We're going to talk about some issues uh, amongst ourselves. Uh, after our discussion, we're going to open it up. Those comment cards you're filling out, uh, they'll be handed to me, and I'll be able to read your question. I'll ask who we are out in the audience, and then we'll discuss the issue that you raised and the proposed solution you raised. Then we'll also have some folks running around with floating mics, and you can shoot some questions and uh, uh, have us hear your voices, talk about your issues, and, and uh, go from there. So I just wanted to uh, start off. Uh, AARP took a survey uh, back in December of voters 50 or older. And uh, in going back and putting together questions for the panel, I noticed it was kind of prescient. 51% uh, of respondents said it was very important for the next mayor to be a leader of multicultural or other background who will represent groups often overlooked in politics. And 49% said it was very important to have a newcomer with fresh ideas. Uh, we've ended up, I think, in a pretty historic spot, right? We have two African-American women who are vying to be the next mayor of Chicago, uh, one of whom, while serving on the county board for some time, uh, has painted herself as a progressive, and another one who basically has uh, no ties to the machine in Lori Lightfoot. Um, so I, I just wanted to kind of throw out to the panel, anybody jump in at one time, uh, are you surprised the election kind of played out how the uh, folks who were surveyed said it would? I, I guess I'll go first. This is Fernando again um, from the Chicago Reporter, and it's an honor to be here on invitation of the Sun-Times and AARP and to be spending a Monday evening uh, discussing politics with fellow Chicagoans. So thank you all for being here. Um, I would say that I never imagined uh, we would be at this moment right now uh, electing an African-American female um, mayor. Um, but I think one of the other things that we need to consider is the fact that um, if uh, Lori does win, she's going to have to work with Tony. Um, mm -hmm. And so while everybody is sort of focused on you know, who's going to win, um, what we really need to be asking ourselves is how are they going to govern? Um, and not only you know, is it about the top of the ticket, um, but we've got the most seismic change uh, in the city council um, in a generation. Um, and so what we've, what we've had in Chicago historically of a strong mayor and a weak council, even though it's not intended to be that way, um, has a real potential for upsetting itself, at which point, it may not even matter who wins, because we still have to sort out what's gonna happen with the city council. Um, so a lot of the coverage that we've been looking at is like, who's gonna win in this ward? Um, what's gonna happen in the next ward? And once we sort out who's the progressive or who the progressives are, or what is a progressive, um, how will that agenda manifest itself? And can the new electeds work together to move Chicago forward and address a lot of the issues that clearly are concerning uh, to the respondents in the survey. Carlos, you've had a lot of experience in this ward. Uh, what do you make of the race so far, and what do you think of what Fernando is saying about a strong mayor, weak council, strong council, weak mayor? Hey everyone, sorry about this. Um, I don't know how to turn on a microphone now, I just realized. Uh, probably a life skill that I need to learn. Um, uh, first of all, my name is Carlos Ballesteros again, and thank you so much for coming. Uh, I appreciate you all taking the time. Um, this race in the 25th Ward is really intense. The primary was really intense, the, and the runoff is shaping up to be really intense in the next couple weeks. Um, of course, you have Danny Solis leaving office after 23 years. Um, those are very big shoes to fill. Whether, whether you think, whatever you think of Mr. Solis, he played a very important role in the council. And Pilsen historically has been a beating heart of Chicago. 
So whoever comes out on top in this automatic race will have uh, a lot on their shoulders, um, specifically housing issues that um, really are uh, pushing people out of the neighborhoods that this ward encompasses. Um, in terms of the mayoral race, I don't know. I, I think there's a lot of talk as to why uh, not enough young, or not more young people came out to vote on election day, given all the activism that kind of, in a lot of ways, pushed out the current mayor that was coming from young people. Um, but I, when I was at, thinking about this topic earlier, I uh, remembered an article from our paper from a few months ago about a youth Chicago study that said that a third of millennials wanted to leave the city, uh, especially African-American millennials were looking to leave the city. A lot of the issues they cited was some of the issues that we can come to mind pretty easily, uh, especially affordable housing and the rent being too damn high uh, in too many parts of the city. And it, once you have a city that's pushing you out, it's really hard to be excited about a, a, a mayoral race knowing that you might not be here in the next four years. So I think that depreciated the vote in a lot of ways. Yeah, well, it seems like that's a common theme, right, leaving Chicago. Um, in the same survey that we cited at the beginning, 68% uh, of folks 50 and older said they'd heard about someone leaving Chicago citing crime, uh, city affordability, city's financial problems, and the public education system. So, Rosanna, are you surprised by that statistic? I'm, I'm not surprised, Chris. I, I, good evening, everyone. Uh, as you mentioned, ARP did do a survey of Chicago voters 50 and over before the mayoral election. And not only did 68% say they knew of someone who was thinking about leaving, but almost half, you know, about 44% said they themselves were thinking about leaving the city. And uh, there were a great deal of concern. Um, and the, for a couple of reasons, uh, the top two issues that people are really concerned about, well, one, I, I'm actually going to invert these. Well, no, the, 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 the top is, is public safety. Right, 87% of people who said that they were thinking about leaving the city have uh, are very concerned about crime in their own neighborhoods, and they want and they are looking for a mayor who's going to um, very clearly spell out their plans for d reducing crime in their neighborhoods. So boy, did that come out loud, loud and clear! And they're clearly, you know. They're not, no one's making this up, you know, so it's not a, a surprise, given what we read in the papers, that people are really concerned about that. And then the second reason, almost as many people, 80% of those who are thinking about leaving the city said that uh, it was affordability. And you're certainly talking a little bit about affordable housing, which is very much an issue in Pilsen. It's a citywide issue, but even broader than that, a lot of people are really concerned about being able to keep up their standard of living in Chicago, right? The cost of living keeps going up and up, e even as, uh, as, as wages are not keeping up with that. Um, you know, people are worried about property taxes, people are worried about utility bills, and so they've made really clear in the survey that you know, they don't want to leave, but they have these really deep concerns that they want the next mayor to address. So I, I, I say all this, I'm throwing out, around some, throwing out some numbers here, but you know, I hope this, this jump starts um, among all of you, uh, a good dialogue. We want to hear your particular, you know, we want to hear your voices here. And so I'm giving you these numbers and telling you what voters are saying, but we're here tonight because we want to hear individually from each of you what your concerns are and what you want to make sure the next mayor addresses, because we sure are taking all of this. We ARP are taking everything we hear tonight, and we are bringing that to the mayoral um, finalists in the next teletown hall meetings that we're going to have. So, um, so yeah, no, you know, not, not surprised at all. The people are really, really seriously concerned and so concerned that they're thinking about leaving yeah to Carlos's point earlier I mean in the February 26th election 52 percent of voters were 55 and older um, that the millennial turnout has been debated right there was some that actually said well it was still a record turnout but uh, Mark Brown I mean if 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 this holds true uh, going forward and again most of the turnout is 55 or older does that benefit a particular candidate uh, in this next round on April 2nd? Well, I don't know that. Well, 
thank you. Um, I, I don't know that uh, that the turnout's going to be the same as it was. I, I think we'll have people who are glad that uh, the rest of us uh, sorted out the field for them and will jump in there and, and vote this time. Uh, but I wouldn't expect the, the makeup to be that much different. Um, we've sort of acted like uh, this was something new that the uh, younger voters didn't turn out. Uh, I mean, that, this is an old problem in uh, local elections. And, and, and I don't know that it is such a huge problem. I mean, it, it, people, I, I obviously, I, I, I would like to see uh, as great a turnout in any election as you can. The more people that are involved, I think, the better decisions that are made and the more uh, people uh, are, are ready to uh, move forward from there. But younger people it, who don't own property, who don't have kids in the schools, I, I don't think they feel uh, as engaged and, and, and or as knowledgeable. Uh, you know, they haven't quite a, a lot of them dealt with those particular issues. I'm glad we have people engaging on particular issues now, uh, like the police brutality. And, uh, I, but I'm just glad that, you know, more people are participating in the state and national elections. Yeah, I guess what, what really got everybody talking about the millennial vote and the younger person vote was Laquan McDonald, all the activism that took place there that led to the tape being released, obviously at Van Dyke's trial, there was huge turnout for that, people um, celebrating uh, after the conviction. Um, you know, what, what do you guys make of all that, that that momentum, and obviously Chance the Rapper was highly engaged. I think we had one headline in the Sun-Times one day when Kanye West and Chance showed up in an Amara Enya rally. We did Rapper's Delight. Who could ever think you would write that headline? Um, so what, I mean, was it a question of this was a smaller group that was just really loud, or did, did, why, didn't, why didn't younger folks engage? I think, uh, I think younger folks did engage. I think even in, I think, at least from conversations that I've had with friends who chose not to vote or who did vote and were really disappointed by who they had to vote, um, I think a lot of people, especially young people, were overwhelmed by the choices they had in front of them. It was an overcrowded field that was hard to sort through, that was hard to really engage with, that was hard to ask a question you know, to a particular candidate on a particular debate night or whatever. Um, so I think a lot of people, and maybe particularly young people, felt uh, distrustful of the slot of candidates. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I will just add to that. I mean, it's all, it's all anecdotal. We're actually still trying to crunch the um, votes by age numbers uh, back at the office uh, to sort of figure out where did millennial votes really matter? Um, you know, what areas what, by the precinct um, did they actually assert themselves and who did they vote for? Um, but I think, yeah, there was a lot of, um, frankly, voter fatigue. 283 candidates uh, filed to get on the ballot uh, for all uh, elected office, all citywide races. It's 283. Um, there were five candidates here in the in 25th Ward. Um, you know, and I watched, I can't even count how many forums, and at some point you're listening to them all talk about affordable housing, and then you realize like, they don't even have the same definition for what is affordable housing. Yeah. Um, so I think that you know, it does become very hard um, it does become very taxing, and, and even though, to Mark's point, you want as many people engaged as possible, at some point people are going to tune out. And my hope would be that, yes, to your point, Mark, people um, come out because we've sorted it out for them. Um, but the reality is that you know it was mid 30s in terms of overall turnout. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think there's a reason why uh, the uh, the people who run our elections. Uh, place it in the middle of the winter in an off year. Right. Um, you know, they don't really make it easy um, or helpful. Um, and then I think once you, once you really realize what you've got to do to get educated on all these candidates, um, I mean, in the, in the 25th Ward, you have a runoff where the top two vote getters got barely 10% of the total registered number of voters in the ward. That's crazy town, because that means that Ten, less than 10% of the people have decided who's ultimately going to run this ward, which, to Carlos's point, is a huge player in the city, 
and ultimately, this is the third largest city in America. Um, so, you know, so, so I, I think that's it. I think it's a little bit of confusion. I think it's a little bit of disinterest. And then I think it's just very overwhelming. And one last point on that note, I think on uh, voter education. It's really tough to expect high schoolers to vote when there are no more civics, civics classes in high school. There is no more attention paid to the idea of what an election means, why it matters, what you're looking out to vote for, right? I mean, 18-year-olds um, are, I was, I, was, I, mean, I was 18 and I was pretty dumb and I didn't know <laughs> what I should have known maybe by the time I wanted to go vote. Um, and I think that's an issue we should deal on a citywide level. Um, and it's unfortunate we haven't. I want to jump to uh, police misconduct because we've opened the door on that. And uh, Fernando, and we ran it in Sunday's paper. The reporter recently produced a story that noted Chicago spent more than, count them, $113 million. I'll say it again, $113 million on police misconduct lawsuits in 2018 alone. Tell us a little bit more about what you folks found going through all those records. Yeah, so I am uh, pretty new to the Chicago Reporter. I became editor and publisher uh, in November. I was an intern there when I was a student at Columbia College, um, and then I was a reporter uh, after that. So I have no, um, uh, cannot take credit for the fantastic work that the reporters at the Chicago Reporter have done, which went all the way back in 2016. They decided to start tabulating the cost of settlements to try and understand how much the city of Chicago primarily basically taxpayers um, in one form or another are paying to settle cases of misconduct. And so the data just came out and it's 113 million for last year, but it takes years for some of these cases to clear. So these are not all cases from last year. But just to add two other uh, interesting and uh, very saddening uh, statistics is um, it's more than half a billion in the last eight years. How many civics teachers does that pay for? <laughs> uh, too many, uh, if that's even possible. Um, also, it means that there was a payout uh, once every two days in 2018. Um, just some extra numbers, because I'm a, a, a numbers nerd. Um, and I have some that I want to refer to from Carlos' story on uh, Lily's shop, which I think are fascinating and can, talk, can address the issue of affordable housing. Um, but the median payout for a settlement, we tend to look at cases like the Laquan McDonald case, we tend to look at the big million dollar you know, uh, payments. Uh, the median payout is $50,000. Um, and the smallest are for $500. So a lot of what goes into the payouts is not even just paying for the, for the, for the bad stuff. It's actually the logistics. So you can imagine that the a payout of $500, like how much does it actually cost to get to that payout? Many times more than that. So what was the breakdown between settlement costs and legal fees of that 113 million? So of the 114 million we had, and let me pull it up here, it was about 24 million in settlement, in the legal costs. So just lawyer's fees, 24 million? Just lawyer's million. fees, yeah. Wow. And uh, for, for uh, context, the new monitor that was instituted by the federal consent decree uh, is, is slated to cost about 2.85 million a year. Well, that, we're still paying. That opens the door to our, you know, a viable topic here. Um, Rosanna and Mark, I mean, what do you feel the consent decree is going to do its part to reform the police department in Chicago? Uh, I, I'll give you my my take. It, you know. This is, these issues are long-standing, cultural, institutionalized, fossilized, you know, it's going to take a long time. It's going to take a very, very long time, I think, to turn around. Um, you know, and I will say, as many people will say, you know, the police department has many, many, many good, well-meaning police. But the culture is such that even among those, there tends to be, you know, this, this sort of permissibility about misconduct. You know, oh well, it's just something that we'll, we'll pay off. So, you know, the consent decree. You know, I, you know, there have been numerous efforts and numerous police superintendents and and, and efforts to try and, and reform the police department. Um, I think this consent decree is 
Um, it's actually pretty thoughtfully put together and tries to address not only um, you know, how you regulate, I'm gonna say and report police behavior, but maybe how you try and support police so that they are um, you know, better able to equip, uh, equip to deal with their jobs. But that's, um, let, me, let me cut to this. You know, that consent decree is born of um, many, many, you know, dozens of interested parties and advocates and groups who I really believe are, um, they give us a better chance this time with this consent decree because there's going to be a lot of eyes and a lot of accountability um, behind the efforts. And I think both candidates, I, I actually believe, are, are pretty, uh, pretty, pretty committed to moving forward with this. So um, I'm hopeful that this time, but it's gonna take a long, it's a long slog. It's gonna take a lot of effort, a lot of, a lot of investment, um, but there are, there is so much at stake and there are a lot of eyes um, and groups that are gonna hold everybody accountable for seeing that consent decree through. As we uh, pointed out at the top, uh, we, we had one of these uh, uh, forums last week uh, uh, at the DuSavo Museum, and, and, I, and I learned a lesson there, which is that I, I sort of, I, you know, if you, if you folks know, read the Sun-Times, if, if you are familiar with my column, I, I, I try not to be an expert on things I don't know about. I mean, we, we are, it is the know-it-all business. We have to p pretend to be know-it-alls every day. So I, I don't know what's going to happen uh, with the consent decree, but I am very hopeful. Um, one uh, thing that makes me that way is that we're not the first city to, to, uh, uh, to come into a, this consent decree. There were several other cities that, that had to do this before us, and I think uh, they were able to learn from, from the problems there. And even with the problems there in, in a city like Los Angeles, I think that there was a general feeling that, that getting the police department out of its traditional ways of doing things made a big difference. And, and, and I think we're gonna see that. And uh, you know, maybe 10 years out, uh, that number that uh, uh, the Chicago reporter comes up with uh, on, on police settlements uh, at least won't be any worse than it is now. Okay, we'll jump into another topic that's of chief concern, uh, property taxes. And I'm gonna put Mark on the hot seat again uh, because uh, at referencing our last forum, uh, we, had, we had a lot of fun. Uh, one of the questions that folks wrote on the note cards was a suggestion that uh, everybody over 70 should not pay any property taxes. Uh, that, there you go, that's what, and that's what everybody did. <laughs> so uh, obviously we have a new Cook County Assessor. I mean, this, this is something that impacts the mayor, but Mark, can you kind of walk through how you're seeing you know, tax fairness play out under a new assessor and a new mayor? Okay, so this is the subject where I, I pretend to be an expert on. Um, the, uh, the question that was posed last week was, uh, will, the, will, will the property taxes be more fair? And uh, the, what I believe is gonna happen is that we're gonna have a, a more fair assessment pra practices and that your, your, your property tax assessment will be more fair we have a new assessor, Fritz Kage, and he's promised to do that. And and really, in a lot of ways, it's it's merely a, a mathematical computations uh, that have to be changed. And in the process of doing that, I, I believe that the people with lower priced homes who were marginally uh, getting screwed over by the old process will see things more fair to be more fair. Unfortunately, you know. Th that's not quite going to get you to what everybody really wants, which is lower property taxes, right? First thing that's going to happen is uh, these big downtown buildings that are going to get uh, see higher assessments, they're going to go under the Board of Appeals, which they all have the right to do. And if they don't get uh, a reduction there, they're going to go to the State Property Tax Appeals Board. If they don't get their assessments there, uh, reduced there, they're going to go into the court system. They've got lawyers with money, you know, to pay uh, for their positions, and uh, 
you know, they have court precedents that's gonna, that are gonna back them up. So, you know, I, I still, the assessments will be more fair. If you're expecting lower taxes, though, uh, if that's your definition of things being more fair, uh, we, have a, we have a city that has, what really drives property taxes is, is the spending of our local governments. And uh, the city uh, is not gonna be able to charge you less uh, for uh, the services they need to provide and for uh, the pension debt that they have to somehow uh, get under control here in the next just a couple of years. So I'd be braced for uh, bad news uh, no matter who the new mayor is. And yes, it does matter who the new mayor is. Uh, and, 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 and honestly, they don't even really have to work together. But they do have to work with the city council. And Fernando made a very good point on that. Uh, that that's going to be fascinating uh, because, uh, you know, who, whoever the, the mayor is is going to have to, uh, probably on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, build a majority. I, I don't know that, it'll be, you know, when Harold Washington was mayor, we had, we had factions, you know, it was started off as 29 and 21, and then uh, it switched to 26 and 25. Uh, 26, couldn't have been, 26 and 24. Um, but uh, this new mayor, it, it could break down any number of ways. And uh, none of them are gonna wanna raise property taxes, but they're gonna have to pay the bills. All right, uh, Carlos, I'm gonna shift back over toward you now because you've, uh, just a quick note about Carlos. So Carlos is a, a reporter in the Report for America program, which is a national program. Uh, and uh, he came to us along with Manny uh, Ramos uh, uh, when, last summer, right? How long have you been June, here now? June. June. So uh, Carlos's position is partially grant funded, uh, much like the reporter is not for profit funded. That's a big part of where journalism is headed. Uh, but. Uh, as much as I would love to send Carlos to every crime scene, to every fire, uh, to every uh, burning desire that is happening at City Hall that we need somebody to go to right away, um, the Sun-Times, we signed a deal with Report for America, which means Carlos's coverage is dedicated to neighborhoods on the south and west sides. And when we were lucky enough to get Carlos and Manny together, we thought, well, should we give them the south side? Should we give them the west side? Should we break it down by certain beats? Should we give one public housing? Should we give one uh, pu you know, public aid, uh, child welfare? But what we ultimately decided to do was just tell the two of them to go out and write the best stories possible. And uh, what Carlos has done is really, he's, he's developed a real, I think, a reporting relationship with the Pilsen Little Village area. Um, so. A uh, question for him. Uh, the reporting he's done has shown that, you know, besides rising housing costs, including higher rents, um, small businesses paying higher rents, uh, especially businesses that cater to immigrants, um, there have been multiple proposals on rent control in Chicago. So, Carlos, now most of those are centered on residential property, but do you think that uh, rent control is realistic, a realistic option for the city of Chicago? Uh Yes, but only because I think any political uh, decision within a certain boundary of, you know, being not too crazy is, is feasible. It really depends if people come out and vote for those kind of proposals. But I think even before then, I think the fight now really is to, and the fight that activists have been leading, is to lift the ban on rent control. So the state passed a ban on rent control policies in 1997. Uh, this legislation was lobbied for by Illinois Realtors Associations and the such, who argued that landlords would not uh, be incentivized to improve their properties if their rents were ever capped by the city. Um, so in terms of rent control in the near future, um, I don't know. I think the people ha we, there needs to be a lifting of that ban first before anything goes forward. And then after that, rent control is really controversial. It's kind of like a Rorschach test. You can throw any evidence and people will see what they want to see from it. There's a lot of people that are against it and cite some studies. There are a lot of people that are for it and cite other studies. Um, but I think that debate will be really fascinating and important. And I think in neighborhoods like Pilsen, well, like and during the last year's primary in 2018, the question on lifting the ban on rent control was on the ballot in 10 wards across the city, including Pilsen. 
and it won by 75%. 75% of people in those wards voted yes, we should lift the ban on rent control. My rents are too high, essentially. Um, and they're going up too quickly. And I think that's what you're saying. People are having to deal with 50% increases in their rent, 30% increases in their rents, while their wages stay the same. And that's the really tough part. People are feeling squeezed out. Um, now, you know, will it happen? I don't know. The real estate developers have a big uh, lever. I mean, they, have, they wield a lot of power in the city of Chicago. They donate tens of thousands of dollars in aldermanic races every year. Um, and as we've seen through the Danny Solis case, through the Willie Cochran case, those donations often open the door to pay-to-play politics that sometimes leave neighborhoods up, up for grab for the richest bidder. So I think reforming that side of City Hall will be important before anything like rent control is ever feasible in the in Chicago area. And then property values go up, then people have to hire property tax lawyers to right. appeal those assessments, then they get campaign contributions from the developers, and so on, and so on, and so on. And so on. <laughs> um, we'll see. Yeah. Can I just add to that? So um, <clears throat> my wife and I, my wife was a former Chicago Tribune photographer, um, and in 2011, we decided uh, that we would stop renting in Pilsen and buy a multi-unit, because if we both got laid off, we could at least have the tenants help offset our mortgage. So I would say that you know there is a one way of rent control, and that's stop paying rent. Um, but that's not available to most people, right? Um, we just moved back uh, from the Bay Area, which as you may know, is a very, very hot uh, real estate market. When we purchased our three flat with a coach house uh, here in Pilsen in 2011, it was $330,000. Our realtor, our realtor told us if we list today conservatively, we're looking at 750. That's better than the Bay Area in Pilsen. So how can anybody afford to stay? Mm -hmm. Because what's going to happen, and I think what you, what you end up seeing in this community is a lot of folks who are owner-occupied or they're using their uh, income to offset retirements they didn't have because they didn't get them having working class jobs. Um, and so now you're looking at a lot of the turnover is not you know, rent going up, it's, I'm just gonna sell. And the, the stat that I wanted to pull from Catalyst's story was just fascinating. Um, so uh, the building that uh, uh, Lily's uh, business was in, sold in 2013 for 390, then in 2014 for 575, then in 2016 for 950 on 18th Street, spitting distance from the train. And no repairs were ever made on that building. Yeah. Like people paid three times as much to value that building, but nobody repaired it. They just kind of waited for it to come crashing down so they can tear it down and build a four-story building with a bunch of condos in it. But you're absolutely right, yeah. The land value is, um, the underlying land value in Pilsen, and I mean, it makes sense. It's so close to downtown. The pink lane is really cool and efficient. Um, it's a nice city feel, right? Like the apartment buildings make it seem like New York City a little bit, or maybe like a little more denser than Cage Park, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. How about on the, to my left, the left side of the table here, what do you, what do you folks think of rent control? Uh, um, okay, I, you know, and I thought, I figured that there are people in the audience that are, are interested in this tonight, because I know it, it has been a topic in the, in the aldermanic race. Um, you know, I, I, my lifetime of experience tells me that price controls of any sort don't really work. That's, that's my life. Uh, I, I believe in market solutions. Those of you who know me know, uh, know what am I writing? No, I, I, I work a lot in the affordable housing area. I try to, to uh, draw attention to the problems in that area. So obviously, people who uh, who believe in rent control, you know, they 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 uh, the, the groups come to me, and, and and I have a hard time because it's it's not it's not what my gut tells me works. To me, you, you know, you you do that, you're taking away the property rights of the people who own these buildings, and 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 putting an artificial situation in place that 
doesn't always work out the way you want. Um, I, I, I believe that you either, you either uh, let the market decide or you, we all dig into our pockets and uh, uh, let in, in, you know, rely on government subsidizing the rents. To me, that's fair. So I, I want to answer the question a, a, a little bit differently. I, I, I don't, and certainly AARP has not taken a position on, on rent controls, but, but the issue here is one of supply and demand, right? Why do housing prices and why do rents skyrocket? Because there is uh, less supply and more demand. And so I, I look at the whole affordable housing issue in a broader way and say, that you know, our next mayor and our next city council need to look at how to promote the expansion of affordable housing and affordable housing opportunities. You know, there are all sorts of numbers about net units lost in the tens of thousands, at least, um, in the city of affordable housing through the years, and some of it is just lack of investment. Right, you know, the city has had historically a number of affordable housing programs, but the reality is they just pass through federal dollars. The city itself has never really invested a lot of money itself in the creation of affordable housing. Um, you know, they have some initiatives, this affordable rents ordinance that's supposed to help create um, housing. Um, you know, fine, it has, has some limited utility, but I think. Um, the broader answer that needs to be raised and addressed here um, as it pertains to affordable housing is what is the next mayor and what is the next city and, and, and city council going to do to expand affordable housing opportunity, certainly in the most rapidly gentrifying areas like Pilsen, but, but citywide. And this gets to the broader, even broader I issue that the next mayor really needs to address, which is how do you make the communities that we live in not only more affordable but more livable and it's really about demanding that the next mayor pay attention and maybe more attention uh, to um, what um, neighborhoods um, what residents need to make their own communities more livable and affordable all right uh, one more question from me and then we're going to open it up to the crowd and, and I, I wanted to get this one in because we kind of glossed over it in the last forum. Um, Carlos, you've done some reporting on environmental challenges facing the south and west sides, and I think it's important to focus on that. I mean, we're in the Great Lakes, right? We got this sort of freshwater ocean off there on the east, our water quality, our air quality. Um, tell us about the findings of some of your reporting with the BGA and how that infects the, uh, the neighborhoods you cover. Yeah, there was a really important study that came out a few months ago that I had the privilege of working with uh, the BGA on and contributing my small part to the story. Um, but the report by the National Resources Defense Council, which is an environmentalist group, um, found that on, on the whole, uh, minority, minority neighborhoods on the south and the west side uh, have the greatest exposure to toxic air pollution and other environmental health hazards in the city which if you've lived in Chicago for more than two minutes, that makes absolute sense, right? I mean, segregation was not only a racial boundary, but it also became a poisonous boundary where you had industries set up in certain places where certain people lived because they were deemed disposable uh, by the larger systems at play. Um, and so, which, and then this putting, I think this issue with the affordable housing issue is really fascinating to me. Because not only are you more like, not only are you being poisoned by the air in your neighborhood, but it's also becoming too expensive to live in your neighborhood. So of course you're going to move, which is why you see a lot of people leaving the city. I think it becomes unattainable. Um, and yeah, one of the other findings we found is that when through the reporting on toxic air pollution, one of the the one disease that I focused on for the report was asthma, given that it's very close, it hits home. My grandma, my grandpa, my mom, my sister has asthma. Uh, a lot of people in Chicago have asthma. And it's no coincidence that more people have asthma that live near a highway or live near an asphalt plant or live near a, pollu a big polluter like a coal plant. Um, and so through some research, we found that an estimated 85,000 children in Cook County have asthma. Of those, more than 50,000 are enrolled in CPS. Uh, there's no cure for asthma, and it doesn't really usually call cause uh, death, but still, uh, black children in Chicago are eight times more likely to die from asthma than white kids. And also black children are also ten times more likely to end up in the emergency room 
for an asthma attack than white children. Um, another, and yeah, and there's some more data, but I won't bore you with numbers. Essentially, those, the inequities that we know of the city, the inequities that the city has grappled with for decades, centuries, um, also reflect on public health outcomes, uh, whether it's proximity to a hospital or whether it's proximity to a coal plant. Um, those issues really uh, manifest themselves in the data, and you can see it as clear as day. And um, yeah, I don't know, it's a huge issue, and there's a lot of activism on this side of the city in regards to environmental issues and environmental justice, which is really heartening to see. Um, yeah. yeah, I just wonder, I mean, the statistics are so sobering. I mean, how does, a, how does the next mayor begin to wrap their arms around that? Uh, it's, it's a tough cookie. I mean, because um, you can't knock down the highways, right? You can't knock down where they are now. Um, but what you can do, I think, I, and thinking of solutions of this problem, I think uh, federal solutions are really important to think about. I mean, when we hear Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez talk about a Green New Deal, um, that doesn't just mean in Washington, D.C., like some politics being played. If, you think of, if we think about a jobs program that could potentially um, come to the city and instead of building a transportation center, distribution center in the little village in the site that used to be a coal power plant, right? I mean, you're just replacing it with uh, diesel-fueled big trucks. I mean, it's the same issue just being built on top of each other over generations. So uh, a federal jobs program that can maybe you could build, build something else that's not requiring a lot of diesel trucks to come into Little Village would be cool. Um, in terms of the next mayor, uh, that's, that's a tough one. But I think giving attention to the issue and, real, and I think not shying away from calling it what it is, which was racism and classism that led to these disparate, disparate outcomes and grappling with, that, with the city's history when it comes to you know, health hazards and such. All right. Well, that's uh, our kind of pre-discussion. Let's get into your discussion. Uh, we got some cards ready, and then we can start passing the mics. Please remember that some folks at the last uh, forum, I think, kind of thought we were the mayoral candidates. Um, <laughs> we are not. Uh, we're just trying to get your concerns to them. So I'm going to start out with, yes. Oh, okay. Is somebody, okay. Well, then let's get a mic over to, let's talk about, while we're talking about the environment, let's get a mic over and thank you, Mark Brown. You're very good at this stuff. Maybe we're going to switch. Thank later. you. Um, my name is Christina Martinez. I live in the 12th Ward, and thank you for hosting this, AARP and Chicago Sun-Times. Uh, and thank you, Carlos Ballesteros, for bringing up the issue of environmental justice. I am on the board of Neighbors for Environmental Justice uh, in McKinley Park in the 12th Ward of Alderman George Cardenas, who um, is an issue that we're facing now. Um, they're shutting down industry in the north side. They got Lincoln Yards, and we're getting Hilco Global with the diesel trucks and the distribution centers at the former Crawford Coal Plant in Little Village, and we're, we got stuck with an asphalt plant from an alderman who accepts money from developers and from Michael Tayden, who is the owner of the asphalt plant. And like you said, the Natural Resources Defense Council uh, produced a map, and you can see that on the south side of the city, it's, it's dark red, and dark red means that's the worst quality of air, of air pollution. So I think the next mayor needs to deal with uh, the issue of the planned manufacturing district, the central manufacturing districts, uh, the industrial corridor issue, how things get uh, done. You know, the, our, our community was not even advised. We weren't even told that, there were, that Michael Tayden had plans to develop an asphalt plant right near our park, right next to a school, the National Latino Education Institute, right near the Horizon um, uh, Math and Science Academy, right, near, right, right where we all live. And like you said, a lot of people, kids have asthma, or, have, or old, elderly people have emphysema, or have cancer, lung cancer. And our alderman, who is a chair of the Health and Environmental Protection Committee of the City Council, is the one who brought the asphalt plant because he takes money from these developers, and that's corruption. And he had to get the zonings built. He had to use the zoning. He had to go through Solis, who was the chair of the zoning, to get those, those parcels of land on, on, on Pershing. He had to change the zoning 
on those buildings in order for Michael Tatian, they made a deal. You change the zoning, I get my asphalt plan. He did that. He had to go through finance for Alderman Burke. So all this corruption, you know, how, do, how does the next, the next mayor address the corruption and the pay to play? And Tony Briscoe wrote a great article in, in the Tribune on July 1st, Sunday. We made the, our community made the front cover of that paper, and he exposed the pay-to-play and Alderman George Cotton, who, who just barely uh, you know, escaped a runoff right. with Pete DeMay in the 12th Ward. I wish, um, I wish my colleague Manny Ramos was here. Manny can talk days about that asphalt plant. He was researching it right when the Trib article came out, and he felt some type of way about not being there first. But he knows it up and down. Um, and me just sitting next to him on an everyday basis, I learned a lot about it too. Um, you're absolutely right, the asphalt plant is next door to a middle school, which is the first thing Manny told me. Like if you walk 20 steps, you're on an asphalt plant uh, from the middle school on Pershing Road. Um, it, and it, you're right, I mean, it, it looks, I mean, it, it raises a lot of questions. Whether or not it's corruption, I mean, that's really hard to prove on this side of things. But, you know, um, the mayor, I think, should acknowledge those concerns that you brought up. and. Um, hopefully, she will. In our discussion before the the, uh, the meeting here tonight, uh, you raised the issue of aldermanic privilege and and how this is an example of uh, how aldermanic privilege uh, worked against you and and why uh, it should be taken away. And and, and I want to make the point also though to the room that in another ward, you know. An alderman could have used aldermanic privilege to block a proposal like this, which is which is why uh, you know you got to. I'm also for uh, putting limits on aldermanic privilege, but you it, you also have to recognize at some level that that that's your alderman's ultimate power to stick up for you in the community now. What you in, in this case, you you believe that your alderman didn't stick up for you, and unfortunately, uh, the, the the voters stuck with that alderman. So, uh, which again is the always the ultimate uh, way to deal with those problems. His title is the chairman of the Health and Environmental Protection Committee for the City of Chicago. He's been there since 2011. He has done nothing to protect the 12th Ward or any other ward. He is not helping, and I would hope that the next mayor, whoever it may be, will have the cojones to get him out of there and put somebody that is re responsible and that will say, I want to protect the people. Because right now, just with this plant coming in, 200 trucks a day when they're in service. And we sat with the alderman on September the, uh, the 19th. I am from McKinley Park. I am a resident. My husband's here. We've been there for 39 years. We were not told that they were changing the zone, that it was going to be now industrial from residential. And if you look on, on their website for the city, it says there has to be a public meeting, a hearing. It was not done. There was nothing posted. There was no letters sent to the homes. There was nothing in the newspaper. And I know the Sun Times covered it. Thank you. And so I am very, very upset about what's going on, not only in Pilsen or McKinley Park or, I mean, it goes on and on. We are surrounded, McKinley Park is surrounded. We have um, the Stockyard, we have a bridge, um, Brighton Park, McKinley Park, Little Village, Pilsen. And we are 14, Pilsen, um, McKinley Park is 14 square blocks. Brighton Park is about 21 square blocks of fumes starting at 4.30 in the morning till say 7 o'clock in the evening. Fumes. 
Now, we wonder why we have so many people with asthma or a heart attack or stroke. We want that mayor, whoever it may be, to address this, to re-look at, to focus on again how they select this plan for the city because it's ongoing. We already have a plan going up on uh, Ashland and uh, Pershing Road. It's going to be a one-hour delivery. So if you order something from Amazon or wherever, in one hour you can get it brought to your door. Where is it coming? In our neighborhood. Now, I have the map here that you were talking about earlier. That red spot is Pilsen, Little Village, McKinley Park, Brighton Park, back of the yards. That's where we live, that red park. That green or lighter color is the north side. And it's because their aldermen can make some changes. Our alderman, nothing. He's bought, he's in the pocket. So, thank you. Can I, uh, I'm gonna try to riff off that a little bit, because obviously the, you know, some of the arguments here for developments like this are, oh, that's jobs, that's property tax revenue, that's, that's value going up, but yet, folks like you come here and speak out about these things, yet I, I look no further than uh, a little bit of ways away here to the 14th Ward where you've got a sitting alderman uh, under federal, uh, and sure enough, he gets reelected. We've had lots of stories about a uh, certain Speaker of the House who does a lot of work in the property tax uh, appeal, appeal world, and he gets reelected. I'm going to pose a question to the panel. Are we just deconditioned in Chicago? I mean, why, you know, uh, how is it possible that an Ed Burke gets reelected? I know nothing against him has been proven yet, but we've written a lot of stories uh, about him over the years. But why, why as voters, I mean, why does the electorate, if folks are so angry, why, why does this cycle continue and we end up in a situation where that red on the map is in a certain area? Well, well, certainly under the all politics is local, you know, the one of the easiest answer, I'll say one of the easiest answers to that is because he's taking care of his own constituents. Patronage. Right? Whether it's Mike Madigan, who, the speaker, who you're, who I believe you were referring to earlier, or Ed Burke, or any of a number of, their, they, you know, their own voters, whatever power politics they're playing otherwise, you know, they get, I'm sorry? No, that's right. That's right. That's right. Uh, that's that. That's it. You know, it, their their microcosm of voters. You know, continue to elect them because of what he's, he, in this case, they're all he's are doing for them in their own districts. Uh, I, that that said, I, I just want one other thing. You know, so you know, we seem inured to it. You know, oh, that's just the way it is. You know, once once in a while, I get hopeful that there may be a critical mass of impatience and a sense of enough is enough. And I I really would like to think, you know, it's not just the mayoral race; it's what we saw to some, uh, in, certainly in in the aldermanic races. You know, I, I'd like to think that you know people look around and see that enough people um, are fed up with the way politics and government have been done that there builds from that. And, and it is keeping that momentum is, is hard work, but it's, you know, this is one of those moments where there's enough of a critical mass, I think, of that kind of intolerance for what's going on that, you know, we have an opportunity to maybe change the political culture some. Do you think, Rosanna, the mayor's race may be a sign that things are breaking uh, that way a little bit? You know, we could have elected a day, you know, we yeah, could have had I, a daily in Roth. I think exactly, exactly right. You know, you, to go all the way back to your first question, what, you know, given what we were hearing in the polls, were, was I surprised? Was I surprised by the results? Yes. Uh, you know, I, I, I have to say, you know, a lot of folks would have said all the money and business behind a candidate, in this case, Bill Daly, you know, would have ensured he'd get one of the top runoff spots. That didn't happen. You know, I, I, I think, um, you know, what we saw here was some, here in the mayoral, you know, election, in the, you know, the Willie Wilson finished fourth. He's not a sort of typical politician. I think there was, 
you know, at least among those who voted, you know, there's still the whole question of who didn't and why and what can we do about that. But um, among the, those who voted, if there is w one, a theme that can be pulled out of that, it was that there was fatigue with business as usual. I just, I just wanted to add, what is your name? Teresa, I, I, think, I think the answer is stay mad and never give up. Because, because, I, think, because I think that's what it, to take Mark's point, I think it's not actually that many votes. No. Ultimately, it's not that many. But the problem is that you got to mobilize. And I, I don't mean this as a, as a criticism. I mean, this is what it takes is you got to mobilize, 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 mobilize and then mobilize, mobilize, and stay engaged. And, and, and you've already demonstrated that you know that the mayor can take him out, right? So it's not even a matter of voting him out. It's a matter of now going to that next step and saying when Madam Mayor comes through, hey, here's the issue that we're facing, and here's what we think you should do. Um, Myself and another woman from McKinley Park, and we got together, and I had the the uh, other candidates come to my house and had neighbors come by so that they got uh, to hear from them, mm -hmm. and say, "Do you want the same or do you want to change?" And for the first time in all these different terms that he went through, uh, he's been there for a while now. I think this is his 16th fourth. year, fourth time. Okay. He, he won it by 27 votes. Exactly. Just 27 votes. And last time he was, so he was he unopposed. So he spent right? a lot of money on us, okay? We just spent maybe a couple of reams of paper, you know, dinners. Right. That was it. We, we, and so we are making people aware, and you're right. We do have to work. It is a lot of work. But it's well worth it if we can get him out and make a change in our community. To the Eric Burke question really quick, I think Ed Burke was a little bit of an outlier given that you saw like people with other legal federal scandals lose across the city, not only maybe like True. an old True. machine. Um, it just seems I think the 14th Ward is its own little planet of very intense political maneuvering um, <laughs> that uh, we might never understand completely. And, and don't forget there's, there are ward committeemen races next year, right? Yeah, I think you're uh, right, yeah. And which is always a, a time to, uh, if you chop that leg out from under a, a sitting alderman, then they're more vulnerable. I mean, you got a long wait here now, obviously. But. Hi, my name's Kenneth Newman. Um, I've been involved in soccer for 46 years, and that has brought me all the way across the city, from Rogers Park to Calumet Park, from Columbus Park to the lakefront. And soccer has allowed me to know the city really well and to know where there aren't parks. And one of the biggest single issues, and we're talking about health, the lack of 400 meter tracks throughout the city for people to run on. And three schools that are heavily Hispanic, Juarez, Curie, and Farragut, well, Farragut sort of has a track but all three of these schools need a brand new eight lane, 400 meter track with an artificial turf field that's lit for night play. And since AARP wants elderly or those over 50 to be healthy, what is AARP doing to encourage people over 50 to stay healthy from a fitness standpoint? Okay, well, I, I think I heard a couple things in there, but uh, what are we, well, we, we all, uh, Hey, we've actually got ads that do exactly that for people right now to encourage them to get up and get active and offer some resources. So I would tell you that sort of the in a big picture way, we got we got ads out there that are trying to say, you know, ARP is about helping the 50 plus live their best lives. And hey, we got some ideas and we've got some resources. So I'm going to say that's sort of the programmatic side, and we're running ads to remind to sort of tell people we've got programs and things that we can try and connect you to. But let me also say, though, you, you started with talking about parks and the lack 
of recreational facilities. You know, we also, you know, one of the ways we um, we talk about and, and, and look at, at the issues and concerns of the 50 plus and their families, and they've told us it's, it's this whole idea of everybody wants to live in a livable community where they can feel safe and age in place and live their best lives. And so some of that, how we do that is the programmatic stuff to help people who want to be at more active engaged. But there's the advocacy side of that as well. And that's one of the things to answer that part of your question that, you know, why are we here t t tonight? You know, we want to be, and our members have told us, you know, we want to see and feel you in our communities, right? Not just know about all that great stuff you're doing for us in Washington and Springfield. We've heard loud and clear that, you know, our members want to see and feel us in their communities, and they want to see us working for them. And so this forum is exactly an example of our being out to hear what you all have to say, and then pulling in, because we have that kind of power and the numbers of members and voters that we have to get the mayoral candidates to actually come. To, they came to our, our forum last week. They'll do our teletown halls next week and answer the question, what questions, what are you doing about livability and crime and education and more recreational space and having the kind of communities where not only the 50 plus, but the zero to 100, because all, we all want a lot of the same things from our community, so you know we're trying to bring that power of ARP to bear more locally to try and influence what happens. So, quick follow-up, so I'm challenging AARP to go to school board meetings and go to park district board meetings like I do, because I sit on five park advisory councils, and to advocate for better athletic facilities for all of us. I, I, I hear that, and, and I agree, and I would say, though, AARP is our members, right? So I would say AARP members, you know, go in force to all those places, and by the way, AARP may be able to help organize our members in some of these places to help them advocate better for what they want and need in their communities. I'm going to go to a quick one from, is Ron out there? Ron. There's Ron. Uh, Ron's got a... Uh, he responded to the question, what problem issue do you experience in Chicago that you want the new mayor to address? Ron's issue and question is, what are you going to do about the tax increment finance money that is supposed to be used for the disadvantaged neighborhoods but is being diverted to Lincoln Park in downtown? And there you go. Ron 2023. Do you have a suggested solution for the problem? Ron's solution is, is allow the TIF money to be used as it originally was to be used under the Harold Washington administration. So what do you, what do you all think of that? Because TIFs are a hot topic. It's, a, it's the three-letter word that should be a four-letter word, it seems. Well, it, it's, it's not exactly, that's not exactly right, I'm sorry. It, in some cases, yes. Uh, the TIF money is diverted. It's, it's, it, all TIF money is diverted from schools, uh, which is a problem. But it's not, it's not like, uh, it's reinvested. It's pre taxes are frozen at a certain level. And then future taxes are right. supposed let's, to be dumped back this, into the community. This, uh, Lincoln Yards project, right? The TIF money that's going to go into that is going to come from that, that project. It's not coming from the west side. Now, arguably, it's taking money that, that could be going to schools right. all over the city and putting it into that project. Now, right. you, have to, you have to ask yourself, would that project happen uh, without that money? That's, that's always the, the, the big question on these deals. And in, in that case, some of it would, some of it wouldn't, I, you know. Uh, it's complicated. The, 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 the TIF thing has been oversimplified and, and everybody is looking at it to uh, pay, for, pay for everything. And, it, and it's true that downtown, you could, uh, especially, you could uh, you could close these TIF districts and this development would go on. Now, when, this, when we started these TIF districts under Harold Washington, it, nobody knew that that was really the case. I mean, he, he 
put in TIF districts downtown as well. So I, I'm sorry, just there's a lot of, I, I, I don't, TIF districts are abused, uh, but there's, there's, it's just oversimplified the way people have come to look at them. I, I'm sure you know, you know this probably, uh, and, and just didn't, weren't able to express it fully in the question. And, and you may probably know more about it than me, but it is. Oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that I would I would make the radical, to use Carlos's term, the radical proposal that we should just stop, put a ban on TIFs. Period. Um, you know, I, I think that they've been more abused than they've actually been used to help put our blighted areas. Um, ultimately, they do drive uh, dollars away from other areas that ultimately push the burden on poor people who don't appeal their property taxes. Yeah, and, I mean, and the, the school of thought was you put a, tech, you cap the amount of taxes that can be siphoned back to government, right? right. You, re, you invest in the neighborhood and all that additional money and investment in the neighborhood is supposed to raise the property yep. value so that, so we're having a little I TIF think, 101. I think as they were intended, they it's were not a bad idea. But right. that's not how it actually plays out. And I think when I think when it comes specifically to Lincoln Yards, I think what really, and this is what I've heard from friends talking about the issue, is that when it all when it's distilled and you see the nine hundred million dollar TIF fund slighted, you know, slice for Lincoln Yards, and then you only see six hundred affordable units being made at the Lincoln Yards site, which will probably be twelve hundred dollar studio apartments, right? I mean, that's how we see these things usually. And then you play ask out. where those manufacturing facilities and all those other polluters are going to go. Right, not Lincoln Yards, not the north side. They'll come down here. But it's like, and then when people see that dollar amount, when people see the fact that those apartments will probably not be very feasible for most families anyway, even if they are considered affordable, um, it becomes really hard to justify in a lot of people's heads when we hear that CPS is broke, when we hear that a lot of things are broke. Um, and it is very complicated, absolutely. But I think voters are rightfully angry. Well, I think, I think what's hard is when the money is not going to public schools, right? Because that's money that would be going throughout the entire city, a portion of that 900 million. So, and we know it's going to be valuable property with high value, and that could do more to get, get, into, that, get into that hole. Um, we have an anonymous uh, question here uh, from uh, an individual who wants to know how the next mayor is going to plan on improving schools. It's a pretty simple one. Um, we need funding in after school programs. How do you plan on increasing funding for, ap for after school programs? And you potential mayoral candidates here want to take a crack at how to improve schools? I know Mark Brown is itching to do this. I can see the look on his face, the excitement. I'll take a stab at it really quick. I mean, I, I actually, I, don't, I have no, I offer no uh, recommendations to improve it. I only have bad things to say about schools right now because I think the next mayor will have to deal with the issue of having a lot of half-empty school buildings across the city. One of the things we're seeing now in Pilsen and other gentrifying neighborhoods is that when families leave a certain neighborhood, um, they're usually not replaced by other families. And if they are replaced by other families, those families with higher incomes usually send their kids to other schools that are not in the neighborhood. So when, when it ends up happening is in places like Pilsen, you had an issue of overcrowding in the 90s and the 80s. Now um, you have the opposite problem, where you have eight buildings uh, that are mostly half empty. And they all run a gas bill. They all run a light bill. They all have their own staff. So it becomes a question of how do we, dive, how do we use resources more efficiently to use, serve students, but how do we keep schools open knowing that they're so important to the communities they serve? Um, that puzzle will be a really tough one. I think for that coming there. Yeah, and I think too when you, uh, so I have a three year old and a nine month old, and I'm actively trying to understand how to navigate the whole CPS system, and it's Byzantine and complex, and, um, and I understand why our friends have left the city, and none of them is 50 plus, right? Because for them, the idea of moving to a suburb and just paying your property taxes, and, and frankly, forgetting about it and just sort of letting it handle itself is a lot more, um, uh, it's a lot easier. Um, and, and you know, than, than sort of like sticking it out in the city and dealing with the, the you know, so I think that 
Um, to, to just pick up where Carlos left off, I think the, the new mayor is going to have to deal with the union, which is going to have a specific amount of power that it wields itself as public employees. Um, it's going to have these half-empty buildings. Um, it's going to have the pensions. Um, it's going to be crime and schools are going to, I think, be the two top issues that they have to wrestle with. You know, it'll be interesting to see the role charters play in all this. Um, I don't know if any of you folks read uh, Rick Tellinger did a fantastic series a few months back about or the Orr High School basketball team. Did anybody read that? And uh, it was about, you know, Orr's a neighborhood school. And uh, as charters popped up around Orr, it would siphon players away from Orr, siphon the talent away. And just so happened that they've got a dynamic coach and that talent came back, but they were dealing with players being shot. It was a, it was a, I, I encourage you to read it online. It's called A Season Under the Gun, if you Google that. A lot of lessons about how sports and charters and public education. Mark, you had something you want to jump in with there? I just wanted to, uh, Fernando brought up something that just whenever, we, whenever, whenever this comes up, it's like, what really is the baseline issue? And, and, I, and I can never decide myself. Is it public safety? Is it the schools? Or is it economic development? You know, if you had, if people had jobs, uh, there, I, I think there would be a lot less crime. But to get the less crime, uh, I mean, to get the jobs, you have to, you have to prepare the workforce. So we need better schools. Uh, but just to have people stay in the community, they, they have to feel safe. So, so to, to me, it's, it's why. It's why I don't want to be mayor of the city of Chicago and why I'm not up here uh, running for it here tonight. Uh, it's, uh, you know, and, 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 and I admire these candidates. We had a lot of good candidates this time, I think. And, and, I, and actually, I, I felt that that was people, uh, you know, not wanting to pick their way through the candidates. I mean, there were a lot of choices, a lot of decent choices. So. I just admire them for getting in there, and they always seem to have the answer. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, good evening. My name is Greg Brown, and for full trans full transparency, I uh, am an employee of the AARP Foundation, but I'm also a, a member of this community. And my question sort of weaves through a lot of things that you've been um, dealing with this at this evening. And so um, one of the programs that we run with the AARP Foundation is a tutoring and mentoring program in the public schools. Um, we survey our tutors. There are over 200 tutors throughout the city of Chicago. And what they tell us that they care about is giving back to the community and supporting young people. So people over 50, you know, their concern is the community, their concern you know, is these young folks. And so um, my issue or my question is, does Preckwinkle or Lightfoot, the, does either one of these candidates, have either one of these candidates pr proposed anything concrete, anything of substance around uh, supporting these young people that are 19 to 24 years old, they're not in school, they're not working, but the you know, the 400 pound gorilla in the room, are these young people, what, where are they going? What, what are they doing during the day? And, and, we, and we know that, you know, it can be an issue in the city, it can be a problem. So I guess it's a question, it's a comment, it's an observation, but have you all seen anything from these two candidates or any of the other, you know, candidates that didn't make the runoff that addressed that issue? Um, I don't know of any specific proposal, but what, when you were talking, Greg, I, remem I remembered um, Tony Preckwinkle's acceptance speech the night of the election. I was there covering it. And one of the things that jumped out to me the most was when she criticized, kind of like under the table criticized, Rahm Emanuel's focus on making Chicago a, quote, global city. And she contrasted that with a city where jobs are created and maintained in neighborhoods themselves. And I think what she was getting to at that when she mentioned that was that 
I think a lot of the economic development that has happened under the Rahm Emanuel administration has been centered in downtown and the north side. And you have a lot of kids in the south and the west side, 19, 24 year olds, who have to commute an hour, an hour and a half a day to go work a minimum wage job in downtown. And that's not very sustainable. It's not a very attractive proposition to make to a 19 year old, um, especially when train bus fare keeps going up. Um, so I think any solution has to center neighborhoods first, in my opinion. And from, my, from, from what I've seen from the research is that otherwise you have a lot of issues dealing with either, and, and I think it all co coincides with the pollution aspect because if you have people commuting from the west to the north to the south to the north, those are, all those are all car exhaust fumes. That's why the highway gets jammed up every day and makes their air more toxic, right? But I think any proposal that somehow uh, uh, makes neighborhoods a place not only to live but to work, especially for young people, uh, is a winning one in a lot of ways. I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not familiar I've, with them either, uh, spe either of them specifically addressing that 19 to 24 year old issue, but I, I, I do feel good about both of them. I, I think that question, if they were here tonight, that question is in the wheelhouse of both of them. Th those are issues that, that, that both of them are about in their lives, uh, you know. And, and uh, I, I'm sure that that's something they want to get at, whether they've got the, the great plan or not, I don't know. But I, I think we got the right two candidates to, 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 to attract, to attack the issue. And, and just a quick follow-up, I, I know it's a policy question, but it's not necessarily a policy solution. It's really, you know, how do we inspire these young people to move forward? And I believe it was um, Ernie Duncan and his group, they did a survey, these, some of these young people on the south side, and they said, what would it take for you to get off, to, to stop doing what you're doing? and get involved in something productive, it came down to about $13 an hour. And um, I guess my concern is, does either one of these candidates, maybe it's, sure it's a policy solution in the long run, but do you all feel that either one of these candidates really inspired that in these young people? That's a really hard question. I mean, I think it's, this, is, this is going to be the proof's going to be in the pudding. You know, we're, I think the one thing you can look at at both candidates, and we were, as we were kind of formulating the headlines on the night of uh, February 26th, you know, we were going back and forth, and first it looked like um, Lori was going to be in for sure, and then we weren't sure if it was going to be Tony or Bill. Uh, so we were toying with like uh, uh, heavyweight Lightfoot for the headline, right? Because we weren't sure we were going to get there. But then once it became apparent that, that Tony uh, was going to make uh, the runoff, it, it really dawned on everybody at the same time what a history-making moment this was in a city where, okay, we have had an African-American mayor, um, we have had a woman mayor, but to have an African-American woman mayor and the direction that potentially could take us at a 50,000-foot level, right? I mean, these are the things that it's going to be really interesting to see, regardless of who wins, is there a mindset change where questions like the one you're asking are, are top of mind? And they're complicated questions, but it's a tone thing right now. So that, and it was interesting to see, pick up the papers the next morning, and both of us uh, played up the history-making nature of the race. So we're at that point in history now where it's intersecting. And just like Fernando and Carlos were saying, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how we might not have the strongest mayor, and how does that play with what could be a very strong city council filled with some traditional kind of machine politicians, but also some democratic socialists, right? So maybe it all, our hope is it all comes together for the best, but uh, the proof's gonna be when, when they take, uh, take the seats. Yeah, and I would just say, I think it depends on, on the youth, because different, you know, different people are inspired by different things, but I think as to just pick up where, where Chris left off, as a city, whether it's a big P or a little P, 
the fact that we are electing an African-American woman mayor is progressive. And I think that as a city, you know, regardless of what the turnout was, you know, regardless of the politics, I th in, even in the, the AARP survey, it said people um, w are prioritizing um, expertise over experience. And I checked the date on the survey, and it was done in December. Mm -hmm. And so how prescient that we get here, and we have expertise and experience as the sort of, you know, two candidates uh, that we're looking at. So I think, I think there's a lot to be inspired by. Um, there's a lot to be proud of. When we were in the newsroom on election night, we were like, oh, this is so disappointing. Nobody came out to vote. Where are the millennials? Where is everybody? But then we're like, wait, but the turnout is pretty interesting. Like, the results are pretty interesting. So I think, I think we do have a lot to look forward to, but, but the real work happens on April 3rd. Um, so hopefully young people will be engaged. Anybody else out there? There's a question from Susan Vega. Susan, yeah, here. Are you still here? Not sure. Uh, she, she, her problem or issue um, that uh, she wants the new mayor to address is a lack of focus on senior issues, uh, lower property taxes and affordable housing. And her suggested solution is make aging its own department. I'm trying to think. Is there a department? I, aging? I'm, I'm all over this one. Um, all right. All right. <laughs> Get so it. So we couldn't be more with you. So actually, um, there are a few things, right? And so part of why we and our members demanded that we be more involved, because there was a very clear sense that the issues of seniors of the 50 plus were being ignored by the city. Uh, and I'll, I'll just leave it at that. It was our, our sense as well. Uh, and so. Uh, you, you know, we sh uh, the 50 plus sure did vote, right? 52 percent of those who voted were 50 plus, and that is not lost on any of the mayoral candidates, uh, the finalists. So here is a tremendous opportunity, and one of the things, you know, we actually had the opportunity at ARP to meet one on one. Uh, we invited all the candidates. We met with most of them, certainly the the two in, in the runoff. And one of the specific asks was, would you create a separate department of aging? There used to be um, some years ago, uh, but it was, and one can debate, and I would debate just how effective it was at addressing the real needs. They ran, seen, they did some things, but it was more sort of social service. Um, you know, doing, you know, at or for seniors, you know, I, th I think a lot of us would have said that it, it, it could sure stand a whole lot of improvement, but at least there was one. There is not one now. It was folded into this broader, you know, department of, I forget what it's called now, human services. But certainly one of our asks of every mayoral candidate was to consider cre recreating, if you will, a separate cabinet level um, department um, that focuses on, you know, I don't know that I would, we, you know, we, who knows what we would call it, because it's not just about Meals on Wheels and senior centers, which is, I think, what the city had done in the past, but we really want something that's a tremendous resource, but also sees the 50 plus themselves as incredible assets and tremendous resources to the city. So we are all, I'm going to say we at ARP are all over. Um, um, advocating for, and the answer we got, by the way, from both of these candidates, if, if I recall, and someone will correct me if I'm wrong, was was that there was something that they were they were um, very favorably uh, in, in view of creating, recreating a department, and they were willing to look to us. We've offered help. Uh, in terms of looking at what other cities have done, um, what sort of you know sort of leading edge in terms of creating a really viable, vibrant com um, department that deals with the issues of the 50 plus. So, um, so we're on it. We're, we're going to let the youngest guy in the room comment on this one. <laughs> As part of uh, my coverage on the Southwest Side, I've also had the privilege and honor, and uh, you know, to cover some of the senior activism that goes on in the city. There's one group in particular that comes to mind: the Jane Adams Senior Caucus. They're very outspoken, very involved. Um, their main focus is on public housing. And I think one of the issues that came to mind when covering stories to their activism and what they've been doing in City Hall and, um, is that the affordable housing crisis really is also a very big senior issue. Um, my grandma, for example, she's 72 years old. She still works. And she can't afford an apartment on her own. She lives with me and my mom. Or she lives with my mom. I moved out, thankfully. <laughs> Not too long ago, though. Um, but still, it's a, it's a very tough, it's a tough issue, and I think um, it, 
whatever the Department of Senior Seniors uh, looks in City Hall should it should I think and on its priority list have housing for seniors because that's a really big one and and uh, not only property tax wise but just being able to afford an apartment once you reach your golden years. We also have a follow up question here. Hi. So um, in regards to department, you know, like having a department that focuses on aging, having accessible housing um, or affordable housing, I personally have a bigger question to ask in terms of advocacy and policy issues that relate to just you mentioned it before, aging in place, right? And when we have things like Alzheimer's and dementia um, just rampantly going through our communities of color particularly, uh, I'm very concerned that when we consider aging in place, we don't necessarily think about those communities. Mm -hmm. We really do think about an affluent white neighborhood. Um, so I think that there's a huge disparity when we're developing these policies and when we're actually enforcing them. We're not really keeping in mind what culturally there is in terms of assets to be able to build on those um, and then realize that there's quite a bit to do. I mean, I, I come at this from a licensed clinical social work lens. I come at this from a daughter that's been a caregiver for 13 years. I come at this from just a resident in the city of Chicago for 42 years to understand that there's so many families dealing with this for generations. It's not something that's happening now. When we deal with, when we're talking about Alzheimer's, you know, we keep saying it's a looming crisis, looming crisis. It's been a crisis. I mean, folks have been dealing with this condition for a while. And we are, are I think, even less prepared than maybe we were about 20 years ago, unfortunately, because the numbers are so huge now and they're just exponentially growing. Um, I think about things like nursing home care. And many times we assume that folks of color do not seek those as options. Um, when you have families that are dealing with Alzheimer's at the final stages, we really have no other option. So when you're having to make the decision of placing a loved one in these facilities and all the reports that lead up to these facilities are saying that our loved ones are neglected, are abused, um, it's definitely an even harder decision to make, right? So you're really stuck between two very difficult stones, I guess. I don't know how to, what analogy to give in that. But um, so where, where are these policies? Where is it the advocacy? Um, we've all been touched by folks that are aging in our families. I'm still trying to understand why we haven't made any sort of progress in this area. Let me, let me take a first step. Your point is, is very well taken, and I would say that that's um, particularly true at the local level. I, I'll tell you that, you know, and, and, and again, you know, a ARP, you know, it's, it's fairly new to us to engage more locally in advocacy, but it's something that we're very much, you know, um, we want to do. We're, again, we're here, you know, to, to, to start that going. But I would tell you that at the state level, you know, that certainly ARP has a great deal of in Washington as well, but I'm very aware of some of the legislation that we're that we're pushing and some of the advocacy that we're doing in Springfield around all of these issues. I mean, it's the full range of what um, the 50 plus need, um, you know, and it includes for those who can health wise or want to be able to afford to live in place. There's a whole lot of advocacy around that, but you're absolutely right. There's all sorts of issues around those whose health care needs may be such that, you know, say living in place may not be it. So now the issues are around ensuring the availability and the affordability and the adequacy of services around those who have dementia, Alzheimer's, and for those who Care, who are their caregivers? I mean, there's a whole range of issues around. You know, these are often family crises, not just individual senior crises. So I would tell you that there is a whole lot that ARP and others do. It's not just ARP, but there is a lot of advocacy that's done, and much that needs to be done. You know, I, I was actually shocked recently. I'm digress for just a, a minute here. I was shocked fairly recently, about a week or two ago, um, to learn that Illinois ranks dead last among the 50 states in terms of skilled nursing hours per nursing home patient. And there's something really wrong with that. And, and now, you know, so we're pushing 
um, with others um, for some legislation to address that. But you know, come back to this point, there is a fair amount of work that's done at the state level, but you're right that locally there's very little that, that's been done um, to help ensure that those who live in our communities have all the local policies and programs and supports, and they and their caregivers have all those local. Um, so again, your point is, is very well taken about what more needs to be done at the local level. Just on one quick, one to piggyback off the question, um, I think it's a very important topic that it doesn't that doesn't get enough coverage from anyone in the city. Um, I think when you when you, when you think about Chicago, you think about like city of big shoulders, uh, all that kind of like mo those motifs, and then you also think a city of immigrants. Um, but now our immigrant population is not only declining but aging and very rapidly. Um, and a lot of those folks don't have a lot of the institutional support that they need to age in peace and respect, with respect. Um, and it's very tough. So I appreciate the question because it should be on all of our minds a little bit more. Okay. Um, I just had a question. Um, it seemed earlier that uh, either Fernando and Carlos were both uh, somewhat outraged at the value of, the, of real estate coming up in the neighborhood and that the property on 18th Street had nearly doubled or, or tripled in, in many times. And so if you have a building that's uh, worth twice as what you paid for it, uh, is Fernando specifically, are you going to sell it for less than what you could get for it to keep the neighborhood affordable? Because it seems to me that everybody wants affordability, everybody wants a, a neighborhood with low rents, but when it comes down to it, when it's your building and it's your investment, mm -hmm. what is, what is the, the individual doing instead of pushing that onto somebody else for rent control or for affordable housing? Because I don't see anybody really taking a position where they're actually putting their money where their mouth is with those, with those issues. Totally, I really appreciate that question because we debate it every night. Um, and <clears throat> it goes back to what I was saying earlier about like the only way to establish rent control is to stop paying rent. Um, so if I was back where I was in 2011 and I was renting here right now, I'd be buying in Little Village or McKinley Park or back of the yards because I would want desperately to start building equity for myself and for my children. Um, being a journalist, as some of us can attest to, um, there's no such thing as a pension. Uh, you know, 401ks are in the case of nonprofits, 403Bs, it's a meager means of trying to offset what are gonna be crazy costs when you retire. And what happens when you, you know, suffer from dementia or, Al or Alzheimer's or you don't have the benefit of your family to take care of you. So for us, it was literally just the, my, my father is, a, is from Spain, my mother is from Paraguay, I'm first generation American and they've always rented out their basements. So it was like, I didn't need to go to college to figure out that like somebody else should be helping me pay my mortgage. Um, at this stage where we're at right now, uh, we've decided not to raise rents um, and to just keep sort of make sure that we can uh, make repairs on the house and keep it going, um, but not turn people over. Because we feel like we, like we have to live it. We have to live our commitment to the community. Um, we're not going to, I mean, if, depending on which side you look at it, I'm either the problem or the solution, right? Because I'm not from the neighborhood, um, but I came in and I bought, and now I'm in a position to do exactly what you said. Um, there's three flat condos going up literally on Cermak behind our house, and each one of them costs more than our entire, than, than what we paid for our entire property. It's bananas. Like, it has to pop at some point. This has to stop. Um, but, but so what I, would, what I would say and what I have encouraged my friends and colleagues and my younger colleagues is like, you know, if you can find somewhere that's affordable, save up and buy something. Um, because that's the only way you're gonna be able to outrun. If you look at census data, Going back to the 1800s, it's a, it's a circle, you know? I mean, the young lords used to run Lincoln Park, yeah. right? And so it's just sort of like, it just keeps moving, and it keeps moving, and it keeps moving. And if, you, and if you think somehow, and this is what really crushed me about the candidates in the 25th Ward, was if you think somehow that any alderman has any power whatsoever to stop the market, as Mark said, you're a fool. It's bigger than them. 
it's bigger than any policy. And so just trying to outrun that, I think, it means that you have to be, to some degree, brave. You might have to move into a community that you might not think is safe, that it might not be what you thought you needed, but ultimately, your pocketbook is gonna tell you where you can afford to be. And there are places in the city of Chicago that are still affordable. It's just a matter of whether we choose to live in those areas or not. I, I, sorry, I was just gonna add one more thing. It's we, where we choose to live. The thing with rent control is that it sounds like a thing to do that politicians want to enact, but there is zero economic data. And with something that Carlos said earlier, that people blind themselves to both sides of the argument, that there are good sides on both, you know, good people on both sides of this conversation or that they choose to ignore. There is zero evidence that shows that it has worked anywhere, whether it's oh. the Bay Area. And just like you said yourself, the market would let it, you know, dictate as to where it's going to go. Yeah. And it, it seems that it's everyone just wants to push this on to somebody else. Let's do rent control. Let's not worry about all the other issues that come with the issues of zoning or issues of not having enough, you know, legal garden units, which I think is a, is a big necessity. But when it comes to rent control, there is zero, and I repeat, there is zero facts that show that it works anywhere. That is not market proof data in any way that it can show that it, that it can work. Anybody that can show it, I would, I would be glad to read it, but there is, a, there is zero economic journals anywhere in the world stating that it works, and yet there is you know, a lot of economic, or a lot of political demand to make this work when you can't show me a single city that it shows that it's worked. Oh, you're absolutely right, it has worked in New York. Oh, you're serious? I think, I think this speaks to the debate that's happening around the country when it comes to this issue. And um, I think Miguel is absolutely right. The, the, it's still, I mean, yeah, the evidence is not great at all. And I think brain control advocates should uh, deal with it a little bit more head on. But I think to your previous point um, about selling in the neighborhood, um, I recently had a conversation with one of my neighbors who said that, and she's an elderly woman, and she keeps getting mail from real estate developers and companies trying to buy her home for every, like literally every day, every month. And they're undercutting her very much so. Um, and the thing is with Pilsen, which by the way, has historically been a little under 30% home ownership rate. So 75, 70% of people that historically lived in Pilsen never owned their homes to begin with. But of the 30% of people who did own their homes, um, a lot of them are elderly folks who are being swindled by people with money and because they're being offered like cash for their homes or something and they have no protections that tell them, you know what, you should get what you paid for, you should get the total value of your home. And I think that's one interesting aspect of gentrification is that people are making generational wealth with homes that their grandparents bought for cheap when the neighborhood was still a barrio. And you can't hate on that, right? I mean, especially for like people who come up from working class families who can now sell their home for two million bucks, right? And like, of course you're gonna do that. But I think the issue really becomes when it's predatory and we have people picking other people's pockets, especially in the community. And I think, yeah. And not, because we, I could, obviously we could talk about this for, for days. I think there's also models in cooperative housing, you know, ways of pooling resources to say, you know, if we really do want to like keep this community of, of a specific, of a specific kind, and I think there's also downsides to that, there are ways of pooling resources. So if it's not just Carlos buying his own building, you know, but a group of neighbors or a group of residents deciding that they want to get in there and offset before that, you know, um, owner, homeowner sells that house at a swindle um, and moves on, trying to be able to preserve the nature of the community. All right. Well, we're going to have to do another one of these at some point so I can ask Fernando who his property tax appeal lawyer is. <laughs> but uh, letters, Like, I've gotten three letters in the last uh, four weeks from property tax I can attorneys. imagine. Yeah. I can imagine. Nope. All right. Yeah. So... I think with that, uh, I really want to thank uh, everybody tonight, not just Carlos, Fernando, uh, Rosanna, and Mark. Uh, I want to thank all of you. Uh, we're going to wrap up here. Uh, this has been a pretty cool, these have been very different uh, experiences. I think all of us on the, the three of us experienced both of them. And uh, it's really great to have a conversation with our readers. I hope you're our readers. Um, but. Uh, 
Thank you. Thank you so much for coming out. Thank you, all of you, and stick around for a second. Please um, thank our panelists here. Thank yourselves, because this is about you. We're going to have a quick little raffle here, so if you have your um, raffle tickets available, we'll uh, pull out a name. But the other thing, um, you know, I want to thank the Chicago Sun-Times for their support of this as well, and the Chicago Reader, and our other sponsors as well. So. Um, the other thing I want to share with you is this card that's in my hand is how you can listen in to what I told you in the beginning, which is our Teletown Hall Forum that's coming up. That's how you can hear the answers to the questions. We're going to take those questions that you gave tonight, and we're going to share those with the candidates, Tony Preckwinkle and Lori Lightfoot, um, and the dates here and how you can connect to that and listen in, because that's the most important thing while you're here so that they hear your voice. So, without further ado, my um, colleague Courtney Hedeman here. Um, I'm, I'm not looking. And if you have ticket number 320443, 320443, must be present to win, 320. Four four three. Going once, going twice. It's worth it to stay to the end. <laughs> okay, we'll try again. Three two zero four one four. Three two zero four one four. There we go. We have a winner. Thank you again. Have a great night. Go home safely, and don't forget to vote.